Well, happy Sabbath to everyone. It's good to be here. It's a beautiful summer day outside. The temperature kind of dropped about 15 degrees. It's fantastic. So uh, get out and enjoy it, as we heard about in the sermonette. We did have one member here that was on the Boundary Waters. I won't give a name, but a young adult who just graduated from ABC. So you can figure that out. <laughs> so a lot of exciting stories. You can ask her about it. Mike grew up as a farmer. His parents had immigrated from the Ukraine to Manitoba, Canada. And the little town he grew up in was Olha, O-H-O-L-A-H-A, had a population of about 100. But farming was difficult for Mike because he liked to entertain. See, Mike could take iron bars and put them in his teeth and bend them. About the size of the green ones you passed coming down the construction on a 465, a little thicker maybe. And, don't try this at home little guys, he could support five people on his stomach. Doesn't sound like much, but you try it. Just kidding. <laughs> in addition, he could hold two automobiles from going forward one with each of his arms. So you can see why Mike liked to entertain. At age 22, he joined the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. Now that was a big thing. Mike died in July of 1980, not too long ago actually. And his story is told in a Canadian short story documentary film called The Strongest Man in the World by Halya Kuchmich. You can check it out. I did, didn't watch the film, but I read about him on the Manitoba Historical Society. Pretty fascinating story. But we have scripture telling us of another great person, of super strength from history. And he's found in Judges chapters 13 through 16. Anybody want to comment who it is? Samson. Samson, that's right. Samson had a lot of strength. He killed a lion barehanded. I wouldn't want to try that. Maybe you could go to the zoo and you can see him from whatever distance they have at the separation there. But he did that barehanded. And then we talk about him killing a thousand people with a jawbone of a donkey. Now, I don't know, the jawbone of a donkey is only about like that long and it's got a little curvature to it. And he killed a thousand people with that. So it's pretty close combat. And then he yanked the gates of Gaza City right off the post, and he carries them to the top of this hill, and he puts them there. About 30, mile, or 30 minutes away, he carried them the whole length. I was trying to figure out what might be similar to that. Best I could do was come up with these doors back here, add about 150 pounds or 200 pounds to them, and you pick that up right out of the building, and you carry it 30 minutes away. You try that one. That's what he did. He's one of the most known judges in all of Israel. You can think about maybe Gideon or Deborah, but Samson really stands out. God gave him great physical strength, but he was spiritually weak. And yet Samson is listed in the faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. So I'd like to share with you three lessons from Samson, and I've entitled this message, Learning from Samson. Learning from Samson. So let's look at lesson number one. Let's go back and we'll see his story here. Let's go back to Judges chapter 13. As we go through the message today, I encourage you to leave a couple lines in your notes because we're going to read the scriptures first and then we're going to go through the points. So Judges 13, we'll start in verse 1. So we talk about this superhero of scripture. Judges 13. This is the chapter on his birth. It's again, again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. That is a long time. It's, about, it's two generations. So you think about being in slavery or in, in persecution for 40 years, that's a very, very long time. Now, there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her. So it's capitalized, which means it was Jesus Christ that comes and talks to this, this woman. 
You are barren and have no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now we know from other places this was a miraculous intervention when God would grant children. Now therefore, be care- please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head. The child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So God chose Samson, picked him before he was even born, and he said, I want you to deliver Israel, but there's some guidelines. You got to live as a Nazarite. What's the lesson that we can pull out? Value your calling. Value your calling. Our calling from God was done with great precision. And it also has specific guidelines. Let's go back and look at Samson's guidelines. Turn with me back to Numbers chapter 6. The word Nazarite is very interesting. First time it appears in Scripture is here. And we don't know much about the Nazarites, how it came to be. Numbers chapter 6, I'm going to read this from the New Living. I like the way it reads in some of these sections. Numbers 6, we'll begin in verse 2, and we'll go down through verse 8. It says, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If any of the people, either men or women, take the special vow of a Nazarite, setting themselves apart to the Lord in a special way, They must give up wine and other alcoholic drinks. So that's qualification number one. Then we get a little bit more detail. They must not use vinegar made from wine or from other alcoholic drinks. They must not drink fresh grape juice, and they must not eat grapes or raisins. As long as they are bound by their Nazarite vow, they are not allowed to eat or drink anything that comes from the grapevine, not even the grape seeds or skins. I love grapes. Grapes are fantastic, but they couldn't eat them. Number two, verse five, they must never cut their hair throughout the time of their vow. I like this phrase, they are holy and set apart to the Lord. Until the time of their vow has been fulfilled, they must let their hair grow long. Verse six, then is the third requirement, they must not go near a dead body during their entire period of their vow to the Lord. So it wasn't even for their family members. Verse 8, the requirement applies as long as they're set apart to the Lord. So we got three requirements. Couldn't have wine, couldn't cut your hair, and you couldn't touch a dead body. Pretty straightforward. Uh, We don't hear about the Nazarite vow today. The word Nazarite actually means devoted or consecrated. So we read it twice, they're set apart. They're set apart. Samson was chosen by God. We're just like Samson. We are just like Samson. Go with me back to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. We are just like Samson. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. Perhaps we weren't chosen before birth, but we were chosen by God. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, we're told here, we actually sing this song. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but now are now the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. God chose us. Why? I don't know. But he did. He chose us. Just like he chose Samson. We value that calling. That God selected us about all the people on the earth. I was doing a little math this morning. I was talking to Mr. McNeil. I like math, but I'm not an engineer math. Okay, I like simple math. But looked it up, and United Church of God is roughly 22,000 members across the earth. 
So let's just, for argument, say the Church of God community is 40,000. All right? I, I can't verify that. I have no way to do that. Let's just, for argument, call it that number. It's, it's an even number. And the population of Earth is a little over 8 billion. So if you divide 8 billion by 40,000, you get a number of 201,000, give or take. You still with me? It's an easy number. Let's say 200,000. So our calling, we translate that into what that would mean. 200,000 is roughly the size of Salt Lake City. Okay, well, that's out west. Western coast, they're a little weird. <laughs> What's a little more home? How about uh, Des Moines, Iowa? It's roughly the same size. Okay, so let's do the flip side of that. So one in 200,000 is the gift that God gave us. Let's look at a couple big cities. Number one city in America in size is New York City. 8 million, 8.4 roughly, if you want to look it up, census data. Divide that by 40,000, you get about 40. So roughly the size of a, maybe a college classroom. Second biggest city is Los Angeles, 4 million. Do the math, translates to about 20. The calling that God has given us is astounding. When you look at the blessing that it is to understand his truth. This word here in 1 Peter chapter 2 on chosen, it's the Greek word eklektos, E-K-L-E-K-T-O-S, eklektos. It means picked out. God picked us out. I can't tell you why. I can't tell you the criteria he used, but he picked us. He picked us. He selected us out the entire earth. And the word study says that this idea has behind it a kindness and a favor. And the word I really like is equivalent to cherished. God cherishes the people he's picked. We read that in some of the phrases of scripture. I'm not going to turn to these, but you can reference them. Deuteronomy chapter 7, God says that he chose Israel, right? You're a holy people, much like we read about here in 1 Peter. God chose you as a special treasure. Isaiah 49, talking about Jesus Christ being the servant. And he says, the Holy One was, has chosen you. God chose Jesus Christ. Now, Christ willingly came. But he's chosen. God chose Samson. I don't know why. God chose us. I don't know why. But God did. It's a special calling. And he chose us to be the people of God. The Israel of God, as we read about in Galatians chapter 6. So do we value that? Let's go with, go with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. Do we value what God has given to us? The understanding, the, the ability to look within the truth of the book of the Bible and realize the plan that God has outlined, the hope that is coming, it's a tremendous gift. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord. That's a, again, expresses a cherishment, a love that God has for us. Because God, from the beginning, chose you for salvation. He chose us to give life so that we can hopefully teach life in a greater way in the kingdom. He chose you for salvation. How? Through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Remember, those who come to God must believe that he one is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Right? So we have to have this belief and trust that God knows what he's doing. 
because he really does, when he selected us. The New Revised Standard Version says that God chose you as the first fruits for salvation. I really like that because it connects back to the Holy Day plan that we will be celebrating here in just a couple weeks. In fact, I really appreciated the song Mr. Evans just led. It gives us that excitement for the Holy Days that will be here in a few weeks. What are our guidelines? Samson had guidelines. What are our guidelines? Let's go back to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 3. What are our guidelines? Very simple. I understand there's a lot of components that go into this, but it says 1 John 3 and verse 3, everyone who has this hope, and the previous verses there are talking about becoming the children of God, the change, life with God the Father and His Son. Everyone who has this hope purifies himself. That's our guideline, to purify our mind. To take the junk that's in there, we relate it to the heart because the heart is a core uh, component of how we function, but it's really our mind. To take our mind and to cleanse it through the power of God's Spirit. To cleanse it, to purify, to live like Christ. You can jot down 1 John chapter 1 and verse 6, to live like Christ. What does that mean? Let's go back to John chapter 14. Try to bring this down to tangible terms for us. John chapter 14 and verse 15. Remember the guidelines. John 14 verse 15, Christ says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. To do the words of life. To do what God has instructed, to try to put those in. Not just in the physical sense, because we know there's a physical component and there's a spiritual component. God's after the spiritual component, the heart. Verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it's he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I'll love him and will manifest myself to him. That's why when Christ says when he comes, well, if you haven't denied me, I'll tell you, I won't deny you before the Father. We've got to express our love back through the obedience by valuing what God has given to us. Verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him and we'll come to him and make our home with him. You need to appreciate the value of what God offers. Not just for now. Physical life and the guidance that it gives, but the future. The hope that's out there. The future that God offers. Satan can quickly cause us to question how and why we choose righteousness. He can do that instantly. We've heard multiple four messages now by Mr. Creech about the Subtlety that Satan has that can take us off track. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 26. Perhaps of all the people that have walked the earth, lived in the physical flesh, Moses could have had anything he wanted. Let's pick up the story of him here in Hebrews 11 and in verse... 24. Hebrews 11, 24. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, now, again, think about his story. Moses was born and then put in a basket, right? He's put on the river. And then Pharaoh's daughter finds him. But he's nursed by his real mother. And he grows up in a household where he's hearing God's truth. He's hearing God's laws taught. He's interacting with his brother and sister. Now, he's young of age, no doubt about it. But he had that exposure. And then he goes back to the palace where he's raised. 
And I, I believe there was probably some interaction with the family. I don't know how that would have taken place. But he knew. Because we're told here, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He valued what was offered. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Enjoying the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Egypt had everything. Moses could have had everything. And he gave it up. Why? He looked to the reward. We've got to look past what we may be experienced. Look to what God will bring. Value what God has offered now and will offer in the future. Because a greater future is coming. God's kingdom is going to come. And this physical life that we know is over. It will be changed. Go with me back to 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. First Peter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Let me read this verse 4 from the New Living. It says, We have a priceless inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. Do we value what God has offered enough to engage and to apply and to grow? We have to value what God is offering us. Because if we do, we're going to apply ourselves. Because we're preparing to teach with Jesus Christ. Value your calling. Value your calling. Let's go back to Judges. This time in chapter 14. And we'll look at lesson number two we can pull out from this superhero, if you will, of Scripture. Judges 14. Judges 14. Now we get a little more color to Samson's life. We're going to start in verse 5. In verses 1 through 3, he becomes interested in a Philistine woman. He's rather belligerent towards his mom and dad in verse 3. In verse 5, he went down to Timnah. Now, it says in the New King James, Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother. It's a little bit of a Misnomer. The King James, actually, you put a comma after uh, Samson went down to Timnah, comma, because they went separately. As we will continue, we know they went separately because Samson is surprised by a lion. In verse, the end of verse 5, a young lion came roaring against him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon, mightily upon him. He tore the lion apart, as one would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he didn't tell his father and his mother what he'd done. So we know they went separate because it doesn't talk about mom and dad being there. Right? Went down separately. Verse 7, so he went down and talked to the woman. And she pleased Samson well. And after some time, when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. So he took some in his hands, and he went along eating, picked up a little snack. And when he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them, and they also ate. But he didn't tell them. He'd taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. What's going on? Samson's pushing the limits. Samson's pushing the limits of what God had told him 
to follow, right? So we have another lesson here. Don't toy with sin. Don't toy with sin. Samson probably only saw the restrictions in his life. Think about Samson. He was second generation. He grew up knowing the truth. Sometimes, I'm included in this group, second generations, we take our calling a little bit for granted. I think Samson did that. He took it for granted. He's toying with sin. He was indifferent towards what God had given him as guidelines. God says his laws are for good. We can learn from them. They're for our good and for our protection. They're a guide to help avoid life's problems. A synonym for toy with is flirt with or trifle with or not be serious. Not be serious. Let's go back to Proverbs chapter 6. Samson is toying with sin. He had a lot of might. He didn't think it could hurt him. We'll know the story. It later does. But let's go to Proverbs chapter 6. There's a principle found for us here. Proverbs 6 and in verse 27. I want to read this from the New Living Translation. It gives a little more color to it. The beginning of this chapter, or a few verses ahead of this, is talking about following the teachings of parents or of God. God is our great parent. Verse 27, we're told, Can a man scoop a flame into his lap and not have his clothes catch fire? I, love, I like campfires. I've said that many times. But you don't see me putting my hand in and scooping up the coals and try to hold them. I might with a poker, <laughs> but I'm not going to do it with my hand, and I'm sure not going to put it in the middle of my lap. We had a lawsuit a number of years ago about that, right? The lady got some hot coffee and decided to put it in her lap. There's a problem. Well, if we didn't get that analogy, we were told it again. Can he walk on hot coals and not blister his feet? Now, I know there's fire walkers that like to do that. I'm not talking about them. The general, everyday person is not going to walk on fire. You get burned. That's the principle. We can't flirt with, we can't toy with sin. Samson's doing those things. He's toying with behavior that was not what God gave him to do. We're not invincible. Now, sometimes we can have a thought, well, I've got God's spirit. I know the truth. It can't get me. Think again. Think again. Take heed, lest you fall. We can't toy with sin. If we allow sin to remain in our life, it will destroy us. We have to be combating it. What were Samson's issues? First, he decided he wanted to go marry Philistine. Against God's instruction for marriage. Then he goes to the vineyards. Now, I grant it, it'd be okay to walk through a vineyard. The last time I spoke, we covered temptation, didn't we? Temptation's easy. You get tempted. But then he decided he was going to pull the honey out of the dead lion. He's not supposed to touch a dead body. Well, then he gives it to his parents. And he didn't tell them. I hope you're seeing the issues, because there's a lot of them. He's toying with sin. He got rather smug in his relationship with God. He got rather smug in his ability to control himself. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7 and in verse 21. We can't toy with sin. Matthew chapter 7 and in verse 21. I want to again read this from the New Living Translation. I've got several today, but I won't do all of them. From the New Living, Matthew 7, 21, Christ says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. Only those who actually do the will of my Father 
in heaven will enter. We have to do. We've got guidelines. We have to be doing. What is God's will? Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3. What is God's will? This is a pretty straightforward answer. This is the will of God. Your sanctification. That sounds kind of maybe a little challenging to understand. It simply means purification. God wants our mind and our heart to be pure. Focused on him. Sanctification. Let's read verse 7 and 8. 1 Thessalonians 4. Again from the New Living. God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. Therefore, anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So when we know, we don't do, we're rejecting God. That's pretty strong. When, is that me? I think I just got buzzed. (laughs) Sorry. Uh, God called us to change and to root out what we see. We can't toy with what's inside our mind that wants to go back to the behavior God brought us out of. We can't toy with that. And it's pretty easy to get connected back to that. If we don't follow what God has given us as rules, they're not guidelines. They're called commandments. God established them for our good. For our good. They're to change our thinking and they're to change our behavior. Now, I, don't, I realize it's a lifelong prog- progress. We, we stumble. I get that. We all do. But we've got to be going forward, not toying with sin. Because we're training to be kings and priests. Go with me over to Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 23. We're training to be kings and priests. Ezekiel 44 and verse 23. That's why God gave us the help of his spirit so that we can battle these things and overcome them. Ezekiel 44, 23, guideline that's to be for the priests, they're to teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. How can you understand if you're not practicing? We're not doing, we're not reading, and we're not trying to apply We can't teach it because we have to be practicing ourselves. We're going to be teaching with Jesus Christ. We have to be learning. What's it say? The difference. To see the difference between this is acceptable and this is what God wants. We have to be able to see that. God will guide us through those things. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. We can't toy with sin. It will destroy us. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Paul tells us here. Therefore, having these promises, and he's referring back to the end of chapter 6, where he's talking about uh, becoming children of God. Having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. Motivations, there's attitudes from the spirit. The flesh is what generally referred to as the actions that come out. But the end of the verse there says, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The New Living Translation reads, let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. 
We need to be battling sin, not toying with it. Samson toyed with it. Samson toyed with it. Let's not toy with sin. Let's go back to Judges, and we'll see our third lesson that we can pull out from this scriptural superhero. Judges chapter 16. Come down to the end of the story of of Samson. Judges chapter 16. Remember in beginning of verse, or chapter 16, he meets Delilah. And then he gives three ways in which he tricked Delilah into uh, having him bound. He was bound with seven fresh bowstrings and then new ropes. And then his hair was woven into a loom. Let's drop on down to verse 16. I want to go back to the New Living for this one, too. Judges 16, 16. She tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick to death of it. That wouldn't be very pleasant. Samson, finally Samson shared his secret. And you can just picture this as he's kind of in an intimate setting there. And he just says, well, my hair has never been cut. I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as anyone else. The hair, remember, the hair represented his vow and his separation. It was a distinguishing mark for him. So now he he shares a secret. Delilah realized he had finally told her the truth, so she sends to the Philistines, they come back. Verse 19. Delilah lulled Samson to sleep with his head in her lap. She called in a man to shave off the seven locks of his hair. In this way, she began to bring him down. And his strength left him. Then she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. And when he woke up, he thought, and you can see his smugness in this statement. He says, I'll do as I did before, and I'll shake myself free. You can just picture this. He's got the... Swagger, right? God gave him the super strength, and he's talking to himself. No big deal. I got this, right? You can see him. I'll do as I did before and shake myself free. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. God had had enough. He'd seen the pattern of his life. He disdained God and scorned him multiple times. God left him. Verse 21, so the Philistine captured him. They gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza. And he was bound with bronze chains. And he was forced to grind grain in prison. The mighty man, Samson, is brought low. Just like that. What's the lesson? Humility brings strength. Humility brings strength. Samson had lost his freedom. He couldn't walk about now and do whatever he wanted to. He's thrown in prison. He's put to work grinding meal, which was considered woman's work. Here's this superhero, big muscles, and he gets to push a stone all day. But he gets to think, doesn't he? He's humbled. He lost his eyesight. I wouldn't want to lose my eyes. I mean... You can't get around as easily. You have to have someone kind of guide and help you. Mighty man Samson is reduced to this point. Samson came to recognize that he needed God. And it's often through the trials that we learn humility. Let's go back to verse 21 again. Let's read verse 21 and 22. Philistines captured him. They gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza, where he was bound, bronze chains, and he forced to grind grain in prison. But before long, his hair began to grow back. What happened in verse 22? 
Repentance. Repentance. You look at what Samson had time to do. Reflect. To think. How long was Samson in prison? We don't know. But it was long enough that he could look back and realize that he was probably ashamed of his past behavior. Probably long enough for him to deepen the reliance on God. He had nobody else. Well, might as well turn back to God, right? No. It's a little deeper than that. By the time Samson's come to this point. The Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary says that it was probable... He had now reflected on his folly and becoming a sincere penitent, he renewed his Nazarite vow. So he thinks back to his early time, the things that set him apart, why God chose him maybe, how God brought him to be. And you know what? I need to recommit. Let's try this again. Let's try this again. You ever been like Samson? Maybe you feel a little cocky. God's called me. I know the truth. We can get a little smug sometimes. It's a bad spot. Let's remind ourselves of how God called us. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I think Samson went through all these emotions. He didn't realize it until he was placed in prison. How much God had given him. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 26. What are we told here? 1 Corinthians 1. 26. New Living Translation. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the things which the world considers foolish to shame those who think they're wise. God chose the things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose the things despised in the world, and things counted as nothing. And he used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. Reread the whole story of Samson maybe this afternoon. Was Samson boastful? Yeah. Was he prideful? Sure. Did he scorn God? Yes, he did. But in two verses, in his time in prison, it all changed. He was humbled. Prison humbled Samson, and it gave him time to think about his life. We go through a similar process when God calls us and brings us to the point of baptism. But as we go through life, we need reminders. Who's doing the work? Of who's making the change within us? We're told in Colossians 3 that we're to put on humbleness of mind. It's the mindset of God, of Jesus Christ. Now, we don't wake up and say, well, I'm going to be humble today. Right? <laughs> it doesn't go that way. You say, I'm going to put others first. How can I serve? What's the need of Bob, let's say, or Mary? What can I do for them? That's how we grow in humility. To put us in the back seat, to go forward with God's help in helping others. Proverbs 11 and verse 2 tells us that with the humble is wisdom. In Psalm 25 and verse 9, we're told that the humble... He guides. I don't know about you, but I want God's guidance. I can't do too many things on my own very well. 
but with God's help, we can. The humble he guides. Let's go back to Judges, chapter 16, verse 28. What is Samson's response? What is Samson's response? Judges 16, verse 28, back to the New King James. Judges 16, 28. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord, God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, that I may with one blow take revenge on the Philistines for my eyes. Now, a little bit of self-motivation there, but we see a completely different person in this response. This word called is a verb, and it's a very personal address. I would encourage you to go back and read Genesis chapter 3, when it talks about God calling to Adam and Eve in the garden. It's a very personal calling, and that's what this verb here is discussing. A very personal relationship. He calls upon God. Now, I understand it's just a basic verb, right? There's a depth there. That is being described. It's the same thing also when Abraham calls upon the Lord. Another advertisement. Beautiful. Sorry about that. We've got a much different Samson as we conclude this story than when he started. If we turn to God with a willingness of mind and to submit, God will strengthen us and he will give us the character that he desires in a humbleness of mind. Mike Swiston and Samson experienced very short-lived fame. Samson may have been the strongest man in Scripture, but he was spiritually weak. But God molded Samson, and he's listed in the faith chapter. God is also developing us. So value your calling. Don't toy with sin. And realize that humility bring strength. Three lessons we can learn from Samson.